so far to Harbor Life. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our sand. Thalassophobia, or the fear of deep, open water, is one of the more common fears that I expect people have. I don't even like calling it a phobia, really, as phobias are generally, though not exclusively, meant to be irrational. However, the ocean is a complete mystery to us. Though our ancestors arose from it, Homo sapiens today have a very limited understanding of what lurks in the deep down, dark deep down. Intense pressure and a lack of visible light make it a difficult place to explore. To date, one of the few people who have actually been able to go to the deepest known point in the ocean is not an oceanographer, not a navy officer, but a Hollywood film director. His name is James, James Cameron, the bravest pioneer. No budget too steep, no sea too deep. Who's that? It's him, James Cameron. The video game we're going to explore today is not the first to tackle the terrifying nature of the deep ocean, but it is, in my opinion, the most effective. A very finely tuned, brilliantly crafted, and fully immersive experience, today we're going to explore the world of Subnautica. First conceived in 2013 with the original title Descend, Subnautica has had an extremely long and detailed development history. It's a first-person adventure game set on an alien planet dominated by water and given the catchy name of 4546B. The player takes on the role of an unnamed survivor of the crash spaceship Aurora, owned by the Altera Corporation, a mega company that seems to own pretty much every piece of technology encountered in the game. The Aurora crash lands on 4546B for unknown reasons, and the player is tasked with both surviving in this hostile alien world, as well as solving the mystery of how they ended up here in the first place. For a long time, the game was available to play in an incomplete format, still being developed. While this is now somewhat common, Subnautica was a bit of an early adopter to the early access world. Players would get into the game and fiddle around, finding and reporting bugs and glitches to the developer, as well as searching for whatever new piece of mystery had been added in the latest update. The popularity of the game was boosted a lot in its early days due to being picked up by popular Let's Play channels, in particular Jacksepticeye and Markiplier. I bought the game well before its full release, and was along for much of the ride as the game was slowly refined into what it is today. There are a number of ways that a good video game can let you know what you're in for. From the lighting, to the graphical style, to musical choices and ambient noise, a good game knows how to immerse you in its world and warn you of everything that you're about to encounter.
have suffered minor head trauma. This is considered an optimal outcome. This is something Subnautica absolutely nails. We begin with an opening cinematic that instills an immediate sense of urgency and danger. The first sounds you hear, an explosion, an alarm, and an automated voice telling you about imminent hull failure, are meant to put your brain into emergency mode. Your character enters an escape pod, and immediately after jettisoning from the Aurora, we see an explosion, letting us know we are in a serious situation. After a moment that was clearly made for VR support, we awaken the pod to find that it's on fire. After putting out the flames and familiarizing yourself with the basic controls, your first intention will be to leave the pod. You have two choices, a door in the floor and a ladder leading to a door in the ceiling. No matter your choice, you will immediately be given a perfect preview of what you're in for. The ceiling door shows you three things. You are on an alien planet, you are completely surrounded by water, and the Aurora is nearby in a state of serious disrepair. From there, you will be inclined to jump into the water, which will show you what you would have saw if you had chose the door in the floor. Your initial experience of the waters of 4546B is comforting. Everything is bright and colorful, and the creatures, while skittish, seem harmless and beautiful and the music is inspirational and cheerful. This is all meant to lure you in, convince you that this is a pleasant place to be, and encourage you to explore without too much anxiety. But all of this is a facade. There's a reason this biome is called the Safe Shallows. You'll be smiling while you build your basic supplies and get ready for the rest of the game, but that soon is going to go away. The last thing to be said about the game's tone setting is the fate of the Aurora. The player is initially told that the ship is very unstable and may suffer an explosion at some point. Several minutes afterwards, the PDA then confirms this possibility, giving the player enough time to head to the water's surface and witness something spectacular. Emergency. A quantum detonation has occurred in the Aurora's drive core. The reactor will reach a supercritical state in T-10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, this explosion, to me, is meant to fully solidify one of Subnautica's major themes. Loneliness. With this, you know that you are all alone on this planet, because no remaining crew could have survived the blast. You will be given a number of coordinates to other escape pods, but after the first few are found empty, the anxiety will begin to set in. You are alone in the ocean, and you are without any help. This is Aurora. Distress signal received. Rescue operation will be dispatched to your location in 9, 9, 9, 9, 9 hours. Continue to monitor for emergency transmissions from other life pods. A good video game knows how to show you where you need to go without actually telling you where you need to go. One of the many film rules that follows over to games is the rule of show, don't tell. Explained simply, it is always more effective to use contextual clues to tell a story to the audience rather than having a character just speak exposition. With video games, this translates more to moving the player forward and how to do so. Nobody wants to walk past a sign that says, this way, idiot. Subnautica understands this concept perfectly. For the most part, the Safe Shallows biome lives up to its name. A notable exception is the Gasopod, a rotund manatee-like animal which will expel damaging gas if the player gets too close. This serves to warn the player that there is danger here, but only if you go looking for it. There is only one hostile creature within the Safe Shallows, which will only be found while the player is searching for a resource called Cave Sulfur. Cave Sulfur is needed to craft a repair tool, which the player is told they need due to the damaged state of their escape pod. 
Judging from its name, the player is pushed towards small caves on the floor of the shallows, and within these, the player will find the crash fish. After being given the clear impression that this is a dangerous planet, the player is then forced to push out from the safe shallows. Escape pod coordinates will quickly reach beyond this bio, and resources will be needed in places like the Kelp Forest, where the fearsome stalker lurks. As the story unfolds, the player will also be forced to go into deeper biomes, either to retrieve resources that will allow even deeper exploring, or to find some piece of story lore that will expand the mysterious plot. For the most part, the game doesn't actively tell you to go anywhere. You just sort of feel like you need to go there, which is far more effective. Lifeport secondary systems online. Running full environment diagnostic and outputting results to databank. One of those places that you need to go, eventually, is the Aurora. It contains vital fragments used to learn blueprints for better technology, and there's also a dangerous radiation leak that you'll want to fix. While this isn't the primary purpose of needing to go there, the Aurora is also one of the homes of the Reaper Leviathan. Oh, you're big! Oh, what are you? Oh! Oh, what do I do? Oh God, what are you? What do you want? Go away! I don't like you! Oh, 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 oh God! Ah, amazing maneuvers! Oh God! Hi! Whoa! Shit! Oh God, it's killing me! Ah, ah, ah. Oh God! Ah, oh God! What was that? What was that? Holy fuck! What is that thing? Oh jeez! Oh no! Ah, ah. What was that fucking thing? Jesus Christ! That was scarier than any horror game! Sally, you're on your own over there, bye! In many ways, the icon of Subnautica, this enormous, loud, and dangerous sea creature, is the game's final way of telling you that this ocean is a place to be feared. You haven't fully realized it yet, but Subnautica is actually a horror game in disguise. This game knows full well that the ocean is a terrifying place, and it's going to use that to its advantage. When the player first encounters the Reaper, they may not have yet constructed a sea moth, which is a game-changing submersible that allows the player to explore with ease. If they're simply swimming, the Reaper truly is deadly, as it can kill the player with a single attack. This is one of the many ways in which Subnautica manufactures its terror. What do I mean by manufacturing terror? Well, traditionally, part of the reason a horror game is scary is because it's dangerous. Yes, the design of the enemies in the world, music cues, and effective sound design all contribute to raising your heart rate, but another part is the fact that usually your character can die, and sometimes it can happen very quickly. Of course, because it's a game, your character will respawn, but usually you'll lose items and progress because of your death. However, in Subnautica, there's actually almost no danger whatsoever. Take a look at the hostile encounters we've had so far. First, the crash fish. It's startling and the rising sound of its attack causes a sense of impending danger like a charging explosive and makes the player run. However, with full health, it will take three to five attacks from different crash fish before your player is actually in any danger of dying. 
The same is true of the Stalker and the Sand Shark. These animals rely on creeping up on the player and delivering a startling series of sounds and sights that instills a primitive fear reaction in the player, despite them being in very little actual danger. One of my personal favorite hostile creatures is the Mesmer. A deceptively tiny fish with large diamond-shaped fins, it has a telepathic ability that it utilizes when the player wanders too close to it. It is your primary directive to swim closer to that beautiful creature. Swim closer. Swim closer now. It looks so friendly. Do not resist. Don't struggle. Again, the Mesmer doesn't actually do much damage, but it's still terrifying for two reasons. The first is that it prevents you from moving. The player's primary defense for escaping danger in this game is to swim away, but the Mesmer locks you in place with only the ability to vaguely look around. Second is the voice. You may have noticed that the voice speaking into your head is the same voice as the PDA assistant, which is one of the only voices that you'll regularly hear in the game. It's a voice that the player learns to trust. Though occasionally lightly sarcastic, the PDA only ever gives information that is helpful and encouraging. However, now the same voice is very obviously being used against the player, and the effect is extremely creepy. Hazardous radiation detected. Fabricate a radiation suit to protect against undesirable side effects. It is your primary directive to swim closer to that beautiful creature. This ecological biome matches seven of the nine preconditions for stimulating terror in humans. Swim closer. Swim closer now. The theme of scares without danger continues throughout many of the deeper regions in the game. The music, lack of light, and creepy sounds made by the creatures are what scare the player, keeps them on edge, and constantly looking around for something trying to kill them. However, the creatures all do a minimal amount of damage, can be easily outswam using the sea glide, attained very early in the game, and will even turn and run if given a few swipes with the survival knife. When it comes to the largest creatures, classified as leviathans, they're simply an upscaled version of any other smaller creature in the game. Most aren't very nimble and can be evaded with a little bit of serpentine motion, outrun with the sea moth, or outlasted with the much larger cyclops submarine. Even the late game leviathan found in the deepest parts of the ocean is little match for the enormous cyclops and its sturdy hull. Overall in Subnautica, you are initially frightened into a heightened state of awareness, which the game then uses to its advantage to keep you on edge while you are in an invisible bubble of safety that you don't even know is there. It's essentially a well-crafted Universal Studios ride, except you are in the driver's seat, and if you do indeed lapse from your state of perpetual terror, Jaws just might actually reach the boat. Something else that games have in common with movies is the fourth wall. While you're watching a movie, you don't see behind the camera where the many crew members and equipment create the magic on screen. Unless you're Alejandro Hodorowski. But is this life reality? No, it is a film. Zumba camera. With video games, the fourth wall is the programming that goes into making the game operate the way that it does. Oftentimes the limitation of the game become visible to the player, and this hurts the immersion experience that is so key to a good game. Many games with an open map will frequently have a wall of two-dimensional trees, or an inexplicable 10 meter high cliff face that keeps the player within the game's map. This is too obvious, and Subnautica subverts this trope nicely. Planet 4546B is a water planet, 
meaning the majority of it consists of deep oceans. However, the map of the game is set on the ridge of a volcanic crater, allowing shallow waters for the aurora to crash in, and for the game to introduce the concept of depth bit by bit. Not only does it explain why the deepest regions of the game look the way they are, but it also explains the map edges in a lore-friendly way. When the player reaches the edge of the Subnautica map, they receive this message. Warning, entering ecological dead zone. Adding report to databank. This is the first warning to turn back. The seafloor promptly drops below you as you witness the edge of the volcanic crater. Below is nothingness except for the ghosts. This is a healthy way to keep the player from seeing the fourth wall. You're given a logical explanation as to why the map ends here, and you're given a danger to ward you away from it. And the only way to actually go down deep enough to see where everything stops working is by cheating. But who would ever cheat? Hundred and whoop, we're turning around again. Three thousand meters. So there it is. That's the edge of the developed land in the game. Whether you're afraid of the deep sea or not, Subnautica is a huge recommend. I did my best not to spoil too many late game elements because I really want people to try and experience this game. It's one of the most finely crafted and carefully calculated games I've ever come across. It knows how to get into your head, how to make you feel small and helpless, and how to guide you on a journey in a natural and immersive way. It's a truly unique experience in gaming that I don't think will ever be replicated. In fact, one attempt has already been made. Subnautica Below Zero, a sequel taking place on the same planet, which, while interesting, simply doesn't have the same lightning in a bottle that the first game has. If anything in this review has sparked your interest, I highly advise picking it up. Face your fears of the ocean. There's nothing out there that can hurt you. Right? If you like this video, please give it a like. If you want to see more, please subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications. If you want to support me further, consider becoming a member, or a patron, or checking out my merch, or my Amazon links. Thank you, and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys. In a fast, cosmic arena. Our imagined self-importance the delusion that we have some...